Hello and welcome back. Um, we're going to be now taking a look at our second module. Keep the questions coming in through the Q&A. Uh, that's what it's there for. We're trying to answer as many as we can. Um, and we've also got a few other folks out there. Um, thank you very much to all of our helpers, uh, Jeff, etc., who are out there answering questions on our behalf while we're talking. We're also going to try and answer any of your questions as we go through, or we'll answer a few at the Q&A section at the end of this module. Kevin, what are we doing next? Oh, next. Well, we have a, we, we've already knocked off one item on our list, Introduction and Toolkit. And the, the following section, we're actually going to be talking about the fundamentals. Uh, what, what does it mean to, to get all this going here? Uh, so, fundamentals is the title of this section, and let's get right into it. There's a... Uh, there's some things we need to cover with regard to the fundamentals of making this happen. Uh, we introduced some of these topics earlier in our first session. Uh, but we do want to go into a little more detail on what it means when we're talking about the, the user. What does it mean to identify a user and what are the different ways we have to do that? We'll also cover ma managing device identity and the importance there. Uh, uh, Simon's actually going to do some really great demonstrations around that as well as then how to actually uh, do mobile device management. So he's going to do some of the initial steps to configure mobile device management using Intune. Uh, and then we'll talk about mobile application management also, some of the, some of the uh, uh, topics around that, some of the things you need to be uh, considering when, when uh, thinking about applications, how they're deployed to your users, how they'll see them on their devices, and really what they care about with regard to having, having the applications they need to do their work, but also alongside of their personal work, their personal data, their personal files on their personal device. So for, let's talk about uh, the identity of the user, what it means to understand what that user is, who that user is, and where they're coming from. Now, as, as shown in the demonstration earlier, we have this, this notion of synchronization that is, is, a, is important for this to happen. Uh, uh, well, we have a synchronization, possibly. We also have the ability to create identities in the cloud natively. We also have the ability to federate a relationship. So what does this all mean? And we'll kind of uh, lay some of the groundwork for some of what we're talking about here. Now, if I wanted to, as a small company, as a, as a IT worker in a small company, I wanted to simply do everything in the cloud, I have that option available to me. I could actually go directly into Azure Active Directory. I could set up a new directory, add user accounts right there, uh, and manage everything right there on behalf of authentication for things such as Intune, things such as Office 365, as we showed with uh, the setup of our trials earlier. But I also have another option, and this is the one that, that Simon demonstrated so well earlier, and that is the ability to synchronize my directory, to actually have information from my local Active Directory uh, populated into my Azure Active Directory account. And so this is going to be useful if I, if I don't want to have that duplicate entry, but I simply want to manage and maintain all my users and continue to manage my users in my local directory. And in this case, the simple form is going to be a synchronization of user information, of the attributes, as well as a password hash. Uh, a very secure password hash, and so I'm going to go into some of the details on how secure that is. Um, but that is an, an option for very simply first populating and then maintaining, as, as we mentioned. We have a, a schedule where that, that d directory is resynchronized and all changes have been saved up into the directory. Now, let's say I decide, <clears throat> you know, I like this ability to manage my users in Active Directory, but I don't necessarily want to have that password up in the cloud. Uh, and I want to have all authentication happening against my local directory. I actually want to have a single sign-on experience for my end users. And in this case, I'm going to choose the federated option. So here I have Active Directory that's populating our Azure Active Directory with user information, but not that password hash. And in fact, all authentication is still going to be happening against our local directory. And you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, that application, that Office 365 or, or some other software as a service application that is, that is checking the directory, checking Azure Active Directory to see if this user is the proper user, if those are the proper credentials, if that device is known. That's all happening in Azure Active Directory. So how can this actually uh, verify against my local directory, the, the Active Directory to have. And the way that's done is, is through something called federation. We have a relationship that's established, and the relationship says that Azure Active Directory knows about my local Active Directory, is able to communicate with an Azure Active Directory federation server, or, or a federation server proxy, and is able then to verify on behalf of that user and their request for authentication. So that way, all authentication is still happening, and it's my local Active Directory as it always has been. In this case, now on behalf of Azure Active Directory, then on, on, again on behalf of the user who is uh, you know, gaining access to that application that they require. Now, this federation is a very, very powerful technology and something that actually has been around for a little while. Microsoft's had this in Windows Server and the ability to set up a relationship between two different domains, two different environments. Uh, it's not, and it's not, not to be confusing. 
because people often equate this to, oh, isn't this just a forest trust? Well, sort of conceptually, it's kind of like that, but really has no, uh, no real connection to forest relationships in an, in an active directory. In this case, we're talking about the ability to, let's say, for an example, two businesses that want to do business together. And in my business, I'm hosting an application, and that application requires some authentication, and it's easy enough to authenticate my local users to that. But I also want to allow my business partner and their users, or a subset of their users, to be able to access that application as well. And in the past, we would have considered creating accounts for those users in my local directory for, on behalf of that partner. But in this case, I don't have to do that. I have a trust relationship to establish this federation that says, oh, okay, you're not a local user, but you're a user that is part of this other company. I can verify because I can actually check with your directory to make sure that you are correct. And if you are, then by all means have access to this application. If not, then of course you're denied. A huge benefit of that is that we're managing users in either case, in either, either directory, just in one place. So the federation makes that relationship possible. It's very much like what we're doing with Azure Active Directory now in the cloud, and then uh, having, it very, having that relationship with your local directory. So a little more detail on what, what uh, Azure Active Directory is. <clears throat> because it's a little bit confusing sometimes to think, okay, wait, is this just basically Active Directory, but it's in the cloud, I've got domain controllers up there, I've got the ability to join machines to domains and, and apply policy to them and so on. No, it's not the same thing. But it is, um, as it states here, a comprehensive identity and access management cloud solution. So it is cloud-based. It's, it's a cloud service. Um, it's easy to configure, easy to manage, and can provide then that uh, access management solution for the sake of cloud applications or even uh, in-house applications. But it is directory services. It's identity it's um, um, granting application access or denial. And then there's, it's a standards-based platform as well, so the developers can actually build against this. We have an Active Directory premium version of that. So there's, there's free Azure Active Directory. There's kind of a basic service. And then if you want to go to all the full functionality and capabilities, Azure Active Directory premium uh, is a... Uh, is a tool that you can use that has capabilities such as uh, what was described earlier, being able to detect uh, that that person was not in one location and suddenly tried to authenticate from another location in the world. Well, machine learning takes over and says, hey, that doesn't make sense. Based on past behavior, uh, we're going to send a note to the administrator. We'll put, a, put an entry in a, in, a, uh, in a report. And we will, uh, hey, maybe we'll challenge that user. Multi-factor authentication kicks in. Hey, I, I, I don't know that I, I know who you are. I'm going to verify who you are, that you're not just somebody else uh, trying to be this person with the same user and password, I'm going to send a phone call to you. You're going to have to verify yourself uh, as that person in order to then regain access to, to what you needed. So built-in functionality is a part of Azure Active Directory Premium. Now, with this ability uh, of Azure Active Directory, of course, we have the ability to manage accounts. We can manage in the console, add, add users, add groups, uh, and uh, Simon's going to spend a little more time in, in that console also to show some more of that. Um, it is... Central administration also then for granting access to software as a service applications or other cloud-based applications. Now this is really, really important and a big requirement, big, a big desire of a lot of companies today. Uh, we're dealing with this issue of shadow IT. Shadow IT refers to the, the problem of some business unit learning about some software as a service and they go to the cloud and they set up their users and they set up their passwords and all their users in this particular department are using this really great application for what they need to do and IT has no knowledge of that, and that's a problem. Uh, IT needs to be aware of that. Uh, what happens that if that user moves into another function or leaves the company? Well, then they have to, we have to deal with those multiple accounts, multiple passwords. We may forget about one or two, and this user who was gone from the company weeks ago, months ago, still has access to our payroll system. That, that's not a good thing. So what we really need to do is take over management of that. We want to be able to say, you know, I'm going to manage, as IT, I'm going to manage access to this other application or these other applications. The members of this group have access to this particular EIP product or this particular CRM product or this particular uh, Salesforce management product. Use that name. And uh, being able to have control over that, of course, is very important for IT and very important for your business. So this is how that would work. Here you have the IT professional configuring or connecting into Azure Active Directory, configuring those applications, allowing and granting users access to those applications, or if those users leave the company, then, of course, removing them from uh, the ability to get access to that application, uh, simply by removing them from the domain or disabling their account, because it can be as simple as that, and that's the way we want to have it. As I mentioned, a, f a feature of Azure Active Directory Premium is the ability to detect and learn and then 
monitor and alert if you have an issue. If someone comes in and, and attempts to access a certain application from a different place in the world, this alert can be generated and it can launch a challenge. That challenge could be that multi-factor authentication challenge that says, we're going to make a phone call to you or we're going to put up a code on the screen. You have to enter that code into a, a certain uh, thing or we'll text you that code. You put it in there. Or maybe it's a, a mobile app that you have on your device. In any case, ways to challenge that user to see if they are who they, who they say they are. And of course, if they are, well, great. We've, we've established that that's okay. But otherwise, we'll deny their access. So how does this synchronization work? Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit already, but this, is, this slide does a really good job of kind of uh, giving you the two different options. The first option is to do the full the synchronization, synchronization of the user accounts, the attributes, and then the and then select attributes as well, but then also part of that being the, the password hash synchronized into Azure Active Directory. So in this case, authentications here on out uh, for those applications that you've granted that user or that group that they're a member of access to, uh, the authentication happens directly in Azure Active Directory and no need for Azure Active Directory to talk any further with your local directory. But the synchronizations are going to happen. There is going to be write back abilities that will, will uh, be available uh, if, if attributes change and self-service up in the Azure portal. Um, but otherwise, all, all authentication real time happens in Azure Active Directory. And then the other example was the federation relationship, where we have the initial synchronization of identities, but then all authentication is happening against my Windows server, my Active Directory in my data center. So here, uh, when Act Azure Active Directory is asked uh, for authentication for a particular user, uh, and based on that user or group, the, the final say is going to be going back to your local directory, whether through an Active Directory federation server or through the federation server proxy in order to verify uh, on behalf of that user that this user is who they say they are or not. Now, I, I know there's a lot of questions. A lot of companies are wondering, well, why we have these two choices? And I think it may be apparent when we start talking about password hashes and the fact that there's a password, uh, anything related to a password, even if it's hashed, even if it's encrypted, uh, I don't necessarily want that in Azure Active Directory. And, and uh, I think that's not really as big a concern as it needs to be. Simon, talk a little bit about how this is really a, still a pretty good option with regard to security. Yeah, so we do get this question quite a lot. What are we actually doing around the, um, around the password here and the security? One of the things that um, it's very easy to think that we might be doing is, doing, um, is storing passwords in plain text inside of Azure. Oh, we're not? We're not. Apparently, that's a really bad idea. Yeah, well. Um, apparently, it's a really bad idea to store passwords and send them across the internet in plain text. Huh. Who'd have thought? We actually decided very early on that that wasn't something that we wanted to be doing. So inside of Azure, we actually just store a hash of the password. And if you're not familiar with um, password hashes, they're non-reversible or incredibly hard to reverse. Uh, it's probably the, the best way of describing that. Um, has, hashes of the password. So we take it and we completely obfuscate the information inside of that password. And in order to be able to get access to the password, you'd have to be able to um, decode the hash. So that's kind of expected. The, sending, the ability to send the password up from DirSync to the cloud is actually done by rehashing the hash. So in other words, um, there's a trust established between your directory sync service and the Azure AD service, and there's a hash happening at the point of sending the passwords from on-prem up into the cloud. And the cloud can obviously then take that level of hashing off and then just store the, the want, once hashed password inside of Azure AD. And then when we do authentication, we never actually um, send anything other than a hashed password up. So when a Windows client actually goes through the process of signing on to, um, or even any kind of client goes through the process of signing on to, say, a web page and it needs to send the password, it's going to send a hashed version of that password up to Azure. Now, there are some rare circumstances where some devices um, will send a plain text version of the password across the internet. That's something that you want to be really careful about. And that's where one of those reasons where you want to be thinking about being able to provide access based on the type of device, the type of connection, basically thinking about the conditions of access that you're giving to your users. Because you might want to say, we've tested this type of device, we've seen that it's pushing out plain text passwords, we don't want to go there. However, everything that we've built inside of Azure is actually built to deal with hashed passwords. So there's no actual um, kind of understanding that we're going to be storing a plain password or a password that even Microsoft or anybody that even had physical access to the Azure system can actually decrypt. It is going to be stored um, as that ha password hash 
up in the cloud. And all of the communication is going to take place over SSL as well. So we actually have an extra level of uh, security in place with the SSL-based encryption. All right, very good. Well, at this point, we're uh, actually going to go into a demonstration. Uh, I think Simon wants to show us a little bit more about licensing our users. I know we kind of touched on this a little bit in our first session, but uh, why don't you uh, show us how this works in Azure Active Directory Premium? Yeah, so I'm just going to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm signed into my Azure AD Premium account. Uh, it may have just, yep, it just ki kicked me back out. So let's just go sign back into this. That's a feature, by the way. It is, yeah. It's one of those, um, it's one of those nice security features where you have to keep uh, re-entering your password every so often. Uh, which honestly is really sensible. We should do that. It's a uh, it's a good thing to be entering those. And we actually just passed a hashed version of the password then um, back up into Azure. So let's go back down to my directories. And let's go and find our uh, MVA1 directory. Okay, so here we can see that this one hasn't had any users synced yet. So just want to show you very quickly the step that I forgot to do a little earlier on. Should have gone to directory integration and click activate it and then hit saved. And that's going to make my um, Azure Active Directory in a position to be able to receive synchronized users from DirSync or from Azure AD Sync service. However, let's go to um, the one that we did actually work with our users on. So uh, this particular account has had some users applied to it. And if we go now go across to licenses, we'll see that we have 100 Azure Active Directory premium licenses. In this account, it's actually um, gone through the process of setting up the trial, it's left it in place. And now what we need to do is click this button down at the bottom of the screen to assign users. And then what we're going to do is actually just select the users that we want to have assigned. So I now get granular control over which users inside of my environment are going to be synchronized. I'll just synchronize all of them so that they're all going to have uh, Azure Active Directory Premium assigned to them. There we go. And let's tick that box. Okay, now that that's done, our users have access to everything through Active Directory Premium. So they can do single sign-in to 2,500 different SaaS applications without having to, um, to know multiple passwords. At this point, we're quite a way in to a jumpstart on iOS, Android um, management with EMS. And we've actually just been talking mainly about identity and a little bit of device management. I just want to explain why we've been talking about identity, just for a very brief second. When we think about identities inside of, um, inside of a, a more familiar world to probably most of the guys that are watching, the Windows world, identities were something that were just implicit. People would sign on to Windows and they would actually access their user account and that would be their identity, their Active Directory identity. But also the computer had an identity. We knew what the device was and to a large extent we trusted it. So this becomes important when we're thinking about these new types of devices because they don't sign on to Active Directory. You, when a user gets a hold of a device, they don't sign in with a user account every time they want access to their email, every time that they want access to um, their favorite applications on that device. So we need to have some mechanisms in place to help you guys actually control that identity sprawl and get access to all of the different tools that people want to be using. It's also really important because when we start to think about the life cycle of a user, everybody's using multiple devices. We probably already sign on um, to an Active Directory. It should be the exact same username and password that they're using for their email. And it doesn't matter whether they're using their email on a Windows device or an iOS device or an Android device or the next device that comes along. They need to have that single identity. And it's critically important for you guys because it gives you the ability to have a single point of management as the end user. So massively, massively important. And that's why we spent quite a lot of time talking about identity. Well, on that topic, it actually leads very well into our next uh, subject, mm -hmm. which is the identity of the device and how that, uh, how that is important, how that can be managed. So uh, we have this notion of something we call workplace join, and that is the ability to register a device into Active Directory. Now, that actually seems kind of strange when I say it that way because, <clears throat> you know, we've had that ability for a long time, right? It's a domain join. No, it's not. It's a, de it's a device that the user owns. The company doesn't own it. But we, we can actually create a record of that device in our directory and associate it with that Active Directory user account. So it becomes part of their authentication and can be used over and over again as part of some authentication to some application. So as an example on the slide here, um, we have Irwin. Irwin is on some device that is as yet unknown to 
the company. They attempt and or it authenticates uh, using Active Directory Federation services, probably Azure Active Directory connecting to the local directory, using some unknown device and attempts to gain access to an application. And here's the tricky part. The application actually requires not only the user, but also the device be known. Well, in this case, Irwin is denied. Well, let's say that Irwin has joined, or maybe has, uh, through that process, uh, been, been uh, challenged and received that phone call and pressed pound, or however that authentication happened for them, for the multi-factor authentication. Now, not only do we know that we can trust Irwin with his name and password, but his device becomes a part of that. It becomes a compound uh, identity. And so based on both Irwin, his identity as a user, as well as the device that Irwin is on with the proper certificate in place, gaining access then to that application that requires it. So again, this is the device authentication as well. It's an identity for the device. The end user uh, and the benefit here is they don't have to know or care about that from this point on. You know, until that certificate expires, they are that the device that they're using is a part of their identity when, when gaining access to that application. So it's user at device in that case. And it validates the device identity. So we can actually restrict from unknown devices and only those that are, that are actually either challenged and can register that device and then in turn have that record created in Active Directory for them. Now, there is a service that's involved to make this happen. It's called the Device Registration Service, and this is part of, uh, part of Windows. Uh, we, we see a number of uh, supported platforms on the bottom left-hand side. Windows 8.1 has this built-in natively. Uh, iOS 6 and beyond, Android, Samsung, Knox. Uh, notice that Windows 7 is also supported uh, for device registration. However, it does require a, an agent to be installed on Windows 7, and the device does need to be domain joined. Now, while we're talking about that, that, that actually kind of seems strange. Why would I really care to know about the device if that device is already main joined? I already know about that device. Why is this uh, requiring a device registration? The answer to that really is consistency. If I have an application that requires multi-factor authentication, I need to have that, that piece in place. And a Windows 7 device can also then be registered in this way and, and known so that uh, username and password as well as this device, this device might not be on the corporate network, but we still have that identity of the device being used uh, on behalf of authentication to that to that application. So here again, we have our user. The user uh, is attempting to authenticate against some application that requires device management. And based on the e probably the email address and, and, uh, and a, a pending of something onto the front of their, their domain part of that email address, we're able to locate that, that uh, device registration service. So we do a discovery. And, so, and uh, it's actually checking against that service, which in turn connects to and looks at Active Directory and uh, authenticates the user. But we also have to, again, we're re requiring the device be known as well. So the device registration portion takes place once we've authenticated the user and maybe we've successfully answered the challenge. We pressed pound when that phone call came in. And so the device registration comes through and goes into Active Directory. There's actually a registered devices container in Active Directory. If you go into Active Directory, uses the computers and turn on advanced uh, viewing advanced settings, uh, you'll actually see that additional container where device objects will show up. And there's a link between that device object and the user account in Active Directory. Once that device is registered, then a certificate is generated and installed on, on behalf of that device and on that device so that future authentications will also include that certificate and can become a part of that user's identity when they're Again, accessing, accessing that application that requires it. Now, that's all good for internal resources and for making services available to the outside world from, from the inside and from our servers. <clears throat> but wouldn't it be great if Azure Active Directory actually supported this as well? And currently in private preview, we do have the ability through something called the Azure Active Directory Device Registration Service. So very similar to what I described with, with Active Directory and with the Device Registration Service there, we can actually host this entirely in the cloud. Now, again, think about the businesses that don't have a local directory. They've done, they, they maybe it's a brand new company. They they set all their directory up in Azure Active Directory, uh, and they also need to or want to base their authentication on that device information. Where are the, where's the device information going to go? It's actually going to be stored in Azure Active Directory in this case. So that can be used, again, for multi-factor authentication, very similar to what we described. So our next demonstration, uh, Simon is actually going to show us how to turn on this device registration service in Azure Active Directory. Yeah, so um, it's really simple. We already turned it on for you. 
uh, as soon as you actually... Uh, done, okay. Yeah, Oops. it's done. Yeah, it's really easy. Um, <laughs> no, actually, one of the things that we've actually done is we have turned... We enabled, by default, the device registration service inside of Azure AD. So um, it's turned on by default, and we automatically allow 20, use, uh, 20 devices to be joined per user. Um, that can be changed from five to unlimited. And uh, we've also made it so that if you want to um, enable people to be able to use... Uh, to require multi-factor authentication in order to be able to, to join a device, well, that's perfectly possible. We just have to change this particular toggle just here. Now, why have we, why have we made this change? Well, making the device registered to your Active Directory adds it as another factor of authentication, so you can have trust that you have some level of understanding over that device. Why have we put that multi-factor auth box there? Well, because until you've done that, you actually might want an additional factor of authentication before you add another factor of authentication. So you can imagine the process. I'm, I don't yet trust my iPad, so in order to be able to trust my iPad, I need to have multi-factor authentication flow in place to make that work. Great. Now, this is a very easy thing to do inside of Azure AD because we've, met, we've specifically simplified the, the knobs and switches that can be turned and flicked in order to be able to enable the device registration service. Um, obviously, if you don't want it, you can always turn it off, although I'm not quite sure exactly why you would. Mm -hmm. In an on-premises environment, we can do exactly the same thing. So this is my um, on-premises domain controller, or one of them, and uh, in order to be able to turn on the device registration service, I've already deployed Active Directory Federation services and a web application proxy. I then just need to run two lines of PowerShell to turn this on. I also, in the background, created a, as part of my installation of Active Directory Federation services, created something called a Group Managed Service Account, or a GSMA, GMSA. So I'm going to use that Group Managed Service Account to allow the service to log on to Windows, in essence. And then we just have to enable device registration. Now, the deployment of uh, ADFS on-prem is actually also getting a lot easier. Currently in preview, we have something called Azure AD Connect, which will automatically deploy Active Directory Federation services to servers that you specify in an on-premises environment. So it'll take away much of the, um, the hard work for you of that deployment, and it makes it much, much easier. It'll even go off and set up the domain names that you need with your domain name registrar, set up all of the DNS names, uh, the DNS records inside of your domain name registrar, and it'll go through doing a bunch of other things. It's kind of beyond the scope of where we want to go with this jumpstart, but just to let you know that that tooling is out there. So once we've set up our device registration service, you might be thinking, why do we do that? What's the, what's the point of the device registration service? Well, it's pretty simple. Once we've registered the device, we can make decisions over what we're going to allow the device to access. We can do something called conditional access. And someone in the chat asked a question a few minutes ago um, around exactly being able to do that. Could you put something in place so that um, you could only log on to um, the, the network with a device if it was in a specific location? Well, actually, yeah, we can. One of the things that we can do with conditional access is that we can say inside of, uh, if the device is authenticated and it's coming from this IP range, then we're gonna allow it access to the network. If it's coming from another IP range, then we're gonna block access. We don't want that device to have access to our network. Or we could say, if it's coming from an IP range which is outside of our intranet, and what we're going to do is force that user to go through a multi-factor authentication process. We can make them receive a phone call, make sure that they really are a human being, make sure they are who they say they are, uh, and then we can take them through that process. So conditional access doesn't just give us the ability to say that this is going to happen in this particular network location. It lets us be really kind of um, fluid around the way that we're going to allow access. It also lets us do some other interesting things, particularly around, say, iOS and Android uh, management. We can actually say that we, don't, we haven't yet had the chance to go through the process of approving, say, the latest version of iOS. We could say that we're going to support iOS, um, iOS 8, but we're not going to support iOS 9 until we've gone through the process of actually vetting iOS 9 does the job that we want it to do with our environment and works with everything. So it gives you those abilities to be able to say, hey, no, I want to just put the brakes on at this point. I'm not going to go through the full configuration of conditional access. Uh, it's actually kind of a, um, a long process with Active Directory Federation services to set all that stuff up. So if we dive back to our um, slides for a moment, I think we're on to the next section. 
Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit more about ADFS access control. I know you kind of touched on this, but uh, from a thousand foot level, <laughs> yeah, this is, more... this is kind of a useful diagram to explain it. Yeah. So um, when we start thinking about um, about devices, we're always trying to we're trying to move from a world of just knowing something, um, the what you know authentication, to the what you know and what you have, and the more layers that we can put in place there that are seamless to the end user, then things start to become more secure for our environments. So think about this: your user knows their password. And until they've enrolled a device, we know nothing about that particular device. But once that device has completed an enrollment, we actually know who the user is on the device and what type of device they're, they're actually using. We can also say that we have records for that device. We know that it's maybe managed, managed through MDM. And yes, we're going to trust it to be connected to the network. So that actually becomes a second factor of authentication. And then we can move into a situation where the user is only allowed to access the most secure resources from machines that we know about using accounts that they understand. And then we can layer on something else like a multi-factor authentication call or maybe use an RSA token in order to be able to take another factor of authentication. So it lets us go through um, quite a number of loops, but essentially being able to do a workplace join or a enterprise registration or a device registration allows us to have seamless second factor auth. All right, very good. So let's talk more, more specifically about mobile device management uh, as, uh, as a topic. I mean, we, we talked about identity, but now let's actually see uh, and, and talk about what we can do uh, once we know what this device is and who's coming from. Um, and a lot of this has to do with a, a life cycle management that has to be comprehensive. It has to be full, uh, a full circle of where things start, where things uh, continue. And so initially, it's the enrollment. So there's a, a company portal uh, where this device can actually get enrolled. Now, I should probably actually step aside for a second and talk about the difference when I say enroll versus register. Because we've covered registration, we've covered using devices as a, a part of authentication in order to gain access to something. But beyond that, we can actually give uh, our IT department some ability to manage this device. In this case, we're actually uh, agreeing to allow policies to be set to, uh, to have things put there. And this is the enrollment process. Uh, so with a company portal that we can gain access to and with an enrolled device giving, giving us access to applications that can be pushed to it, uh, showing us the custom terms of enrollment. So as an end user, I understand these are, these are the requirements. Um, they're gonna, there's going to be a password enforced on this device. It's going to lock after a certain amount of seconds or minutes, hopefully, uh, not seconds. And, and so on. So these policies can actually be part of that. And that's the agreement that the end user has to understand and then agree to before their device gets enrolled. And, uh, and, and being able to configure items on the device, being able to set up uh, email profiles, VPN profiles, and so on. So the enrollment is the first uh, step in this. Beyond enrollment then, provisioning the device. So once that device is enrolled, we can do that deployment. We have the ability to, because the, the uh, end user has agreed to, do, to allow this on their device, deploy certificates, configure email profiles, Wi-Fi profiles, and so on. And then once that device <clears throat> has been provisioned, we've done the configuration, now as IT, we have the ability to manage and protect that device. So we have uh, the ability to inventory um, applications. Now I'm saying inventory applications that are company applications, in inventory information that's on that device that is uh, corporate information, not personal information. And then, of course, at some point, there's going to, at the end of this life cycle, that user or the, whoever this is that it decides to give that iPad to one of their children because they got the new model, uh, we're going to retire that device. And so either IT can take this on and do this for the user, or, very importantly, the end user can do this. They have the ability to say, this is no longer the device I'm going to use for work. I'm going to turn off this management capability and, uh, and with the understanding that any company installed enforced applications and policies and email profiles, these may be and probably will be removed but leaving everything else, leaving the personal information along. And uh, you know, of course, that's a, that's a situation also where the user reports a lost or stolen device. And uh, we need to maybe do uh, not just a retirement of that device under, from under management, but actually do a full wipe of that device. Uh, we can create, uh, do a complete factory reset on that device so that we know that whoever ended up with that device, well, they get a fresh device, but not a device that has anything personal or anything company confidential on it. 
so to make this happen in a consistent way, and, and when I say consistent, I really am talking about the platform, because of course all, all uh, uh, different platforms or different mobile devices have their, their common look and feel among applications and so on. And so we have an application called the Company Portal, and it's available in the Apple Store, it's available in the Google Store, it's available in the Microsoft Store, uh, and you can download that to your device, and it looks and behaves just like any other application would on that platform. So it looks like a Windows 8 uh, application on a Windows 8 device and so on. And the idea here also is that it, it's that portal to gain access to what IT has provisioned for me. So when I go into that portal, I authenticate myself. Uh, I get into the portal because my device is, not, is enrolled now, so it's actually under management. And then in turn, I can see the applications that, that IT has made available to me, that has, re that has recommended for me. Uh, and I could even have, as a, as a part of this process, applications pushed to my device that are required by me. Along with that, again, um, being able to uh, see the ability to manage my other devices as well. Because in this portal, I can see, based on me, uh, I can see my devices. I can see the dev other devices that I may have enrolled. So in this same portal, I'll see that I have this local device that I'm currently using, plus I'll see my iPhone, my, my Windows phone, my iPad. I'll see all those devices from the same console. And then with that knowledge of the different devices that I have, I can see, oh, you know what, that iPad there, that's actually not something I'm using anymore. I'm, I've, I've given that to my daughter, um, so now I'm going to unenroll that device. And I can do that from any of the other devices within that company portal, being able to go to that device and say, okay, remove it from management, or worst case, lost it, got stolen, uh, left it in a taxi cab somewhere, I'm going to do a, a complete wipe of that device. And that's, that's self-service at its best, uh, to be able to manage the devices that I have, the ones that I want to be able to use for work, and you know the, the event where we come to that last part of our, of our circle where we're going to remove that device uh, from, from uh, enrollment. And the ability to contact IT. We're going to put contact information up there. IT can configure this in Intune or Configuration Manager and so that uh, you have information you know, during that subscription process, when, when uh, Simon joined the uh, uh, connected configuration manager up to Intune, he put information about IT and how, who to contact. That's all information that shows up on the screen in the company portal so that the end user is able to uh, have, you know, have access and gain access to IT. Now, on the IT side of it, <clears throat> single console for managing mobile device, for doing mobile device management. Now that's, that's really important. We wouldn't want to necessarily have to use uh, this other product or this other product or have entirely different teams of products uh, of people supporting these different mobile device management products. We're going to use a tool set that we're familiar with. Uh, we're going to use Active Directory for authentication. We're going to use uh, Intune and Configuration Manager. I've already got a great practice built around Configuration Manager. So I know that my folks that, that work with deploying applications and, and managing device collections, they're going to see mobile devices there as well. They're going to be able to deploy applications to collections of users that also have installations that can go on their mobile devices. And through that same console then, of course, populating what the end user sees with uh, with, with the company portal. So having one management console for mobile device, mobile device management, whether it be purely in the Intune web console, if we choose to go just the Intune route for mobile device management, or Configuration Manager, which I know and trust and now can continue to use to do mobile device management, uh, a single pane of glass in either one of those choices. So a little bit more about mobile device management. Here I have an end user gaining access to the company portal. And as we described, they see the list of applications that are recommended for them based on who they are. So they are coming in from an enrolled device. Applications are shown to them that are applicable to the device they happen to be on at that time. So if, if I'm on my Windows phone, I'm not going to see the iOS app uh, populated there. Um, it just wouldn't make sense. So we're only going to see the applications that, that apply to us. Now, along with that, of course, IT has the ability to apply policies, to, to then uh, apply certificates, to create and deploy VPN profiles and make those available. Email profiles, I mean, very easy to suddenly, after I've enrolled this device, now there's my email profile, I'm asked for my password, and I didn't have to do anything other than yes, say yes, and enter my password, and now I'm connected uh, to email on that device as well. There's a lot of benefits with that process. So with that, uh, we're going to take a minute for uh, Simon to do a little demonstration of device management in Intune and how to get that enabled. 
I think I caught him on another screen. I think Simon was uh, answering questions for us in the Q&A. So I was. Appreciate that. Surprise. Always back. There we go. Okay. Just before we do that, um, I, I, uh, I'm just going to show you one other thing, because just to answer a couple of those questions in the Q&A. Oh, great. Um, someone uh, raised a question. Sorry, I would need to flip back to the, uh, to the other browser to see who. Um, asked a question about, um, is it possible to get a view of what devices a, um, a user has associated to them in a more user-friendly way for the administrator than... Um, we can currently do inside of on-premises AD. The answer to that is actually yes, and it gives us quite a lot of power. So here's, a, um, here's an interesting setup. Um, I actually have a user here called Dan Park. He's one of my federated users. If we have a look at his, uh, his profile very quickly, we can see that he's actually signing in through ADFS. So in this case, his devices are actually going to be joined to uh, the domain using the on-premises version of Workplace Join. If we have a quick look at the devices tab here, what we'll see is that actually we're not just seeing the devices that he has registered, but we're also seeing other information. So we can see everywhere that he's using his user account in order to be able to access his information. Then this is incredibly powerful because as those devices move all over the world now, it's the kind of information you want to be seeing. We can see exactly which browsers he's using and uh, what devices he's using them from, whereabouts in the world, and what IP addresses. Now, if I go to the Devices tab, if he had any devices registered against Azure Active Directory, we'd be seeing them in this location. Right now, we don't synchronize devices from the on-premises environment into the Azure AD environment, but we would be seeing anything that was uh, directly added into Workplace Join with or device registration with Azure Active Directory. You can also go across to the Activity tab here and get a really detailed report of everywhere that he's been, been signing in from between two time periods. So um, I have a feeling I don't have anything in this time period. We can kind of skip back to here maybe and say, OK, so I've not got any activity for Dan during the last couple of weeks, so there's nothing going to appear. But it gives us that ability to have a view over what our users are actually doing when they're globally connecting to any resources. This demo, however, is how we set up the device management inside of Microsoft Intune. So I'm, going to, I'm in my Intune portal here, and I'm going to go to admin. Now, this is probably going to ask me to re-authenticate. It's been a few minutes, and I'm going to have to sign in with a slightly different account here. So sign in with a different Microsoft account. I will close that link down, and we'll go back to manage.microsoft.com. So admin at uh, iOS, Android, MVA3. Okay, so we're almost back where we were. And we're going to go down to the administration panel in just a second. There we go. Go down to the administration pane. Now, from here, we can configure all aspects of the uh, Microsoft Intune tenant. What we're actually going to do, though, is go down to mo uh, mobile device management. And the first thing that we'll see is we need to um, choose mic uh, Microsoft Intune to manage mobile devices. So we'll say OK. And we'll tick yes, having read the warning. It's the same warning that we get when we do that configuration through Configuration Manager, as we saw earlier. It's saying either manage through Configuration Manager or through Intune don't manage through both. So now that we've done that, we've actually set what we call the Mobile Device Management Authority to be Microsoft Intune in this case. Now we need to go through the process of enabling the other platforms that we want to support. You can see that Android has already been enabled for support. That's because Android is actually very easy. There's very um, little to stop you from installing applications or software onto an Android device. We want to go and enable the iOS platform, so we'll hit enable iOS. That is then going to say, hey, we need to go and download the APN certificate request. So we now need to go and in, to, in order to enable iOS management, we need to go and actually apply to Apple for a certificate for our Windows Intune, Microsoft Intune tenant in order to be able to use it to manage and be trusted by iOS devices. So I'm going to download the APN request. Uh, I'm going to save it to the desktop, nice and easy. Call it rec, and hit save. Now we have to go across to Apple's push notification certificate portal. Go across there. We sign in with our Apple ID. This is just exactly the same ID that you, you would use for your, um, uh, your iTunes account, for example. 
I put in the password and hit sign in. Okay, you can see that I've done this once or twice. <laughs> uh, but we're going to create a new certificate. And I've read all of Apple's terms and conditions. We'll say accept. And then I need to provide a, uh, the certificate that I just downloaded from Intune. So here's my CSR. In fact, it's not a, uh, a certificate. It is a certificate request file. Uh, I'm going to just pro provide a note. This is just for me. And we'll hit upload. We're about to go through a little bit of a strange process with Apple's um, site here. It doesn't necessarily love Internet Explorer. No, in fact, I, I usually just cancel and then you go right back in. Yeah, there's the, there exactly. Yeah. So if we just cancel, <clears throat> go back, uh, we should find that we have a new certificate that's been issued for us. At the top of the list. Uh, yeah, it is at the top of the list. There we go. And then let's go and hit download. And we'll save that. Okay, I've now downloaded the PEM file. So that's all good. Let's go back into Intune and upload the certificate file. We need to browse for the APN certificate. Uh, I think it just ended up in there. There we go. And we need to provide the Apple ID again. And we'll hit upload. Okay. That actually wasn't the correct certificate, which uh, so it just told us that very nice and easily. So let's just refresh this page, see if the certificate has appeared. Nope. Okay, we'll go through the process of doing this again. Uh, it's on my desktop. There's the CSR. Okay, it's actually worked this time. So we're going to save this JSON file and then open it. We don't want to open it in any of those options. Let's go back to the portal. Maybe sign back in again. Give it a second or two to refresh. I tend to find this needs to be done a couple of times to get Apple's site to actually accept it. Let's open this in Internet Explorer as well. Okay. Hmm. Here we go. Let's try one of these on. New ones that's down at the bottom here. Let's download this one. Save. Okay. And let's give that new download a test. I was going to say, I thought it was strange that it was up at the top. Usually it's at the bottom. Yeah, it just, normally just does populate the... straight down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of something well, a bit I strange. I think we were looking at the expiration date of of 2014. You've been doing this for a year now. I have. You're right. It's yeah. 2014. I have been doing this for a year. Wow. Well, yep. That is actually set to, uh, to December 8, 2014. And now we're set to December 8, 2015. That literally means that to the day I was presenting. For the uh, very first time. Very you, just, yeah. you just had a certificate expire in front Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. Yeah. We had a certificate enroll. Wow. That's kind of That's a good annoying. demo. Okay. So that now done, we have the ability to manage iOS devices. So if we go back to our mobile device management environment, we can now see the iOS and Android ready to go. We can also set up a connection to Exchange. We'll have a look at that a little later on as well. Um, and we can also obviously manage Windows Phone 8.1 devices, although we're not going to go anywhere near those today. So that takes us through the process of enabling MDM inside of uh, Microsoft Intune. All right, very good. So let's talk about mobile applications, because it's now uh, we've talked about identities, we've talked about mobile devices. Applications are also an important part of our management strategy. And it's about the user and their desire to have applications that are their own, because it is, after all, their device, plus applications that are company-managed, company, company applications. And the user doesn't really, uh, they want to organize their screen however they want. This is their list of applications, whether they be personal or company. But there are managed applications that probably came from that user connecting to the company portal, downloading the recommended applications, or having those applications installed automatically for them. They have their personal applications, certainly, 
that are, are still a part of that, and they're all being managed and being used right side by side. So again, the user really doesn't care about the fact that some of these applications are managed. Now, IT on the other hand, well, they do care. I mean, the fact that we, we want to make our users productive, we want to give them access to corporate resources, but even giving them secured access to those corporate resources on a personal device. And extend then through uh, not only managed applications that support the security that's required for this, but also even extending uh, those sorts of capabilities using a wrapper around applications that are just traditional line of business applications. Now, if an email attachment comes in uh, in a managed app, well, here's a, here's a, let's say an attachment comes in that's an Excel document. The Excel document, uh, the user has the ability to go into that document, maybe select some text, select some of those, so those uh, cells, and copy. And perhaps this user wants to copy that data into a personal application, personal notepad, something like that. Well, denied. Because this is a managed app, because there's policy in place that says this data is company only, you can't. And in fact, paste won't even show up if you right click on or otherwise attempt to paste into that personal application. But to a managed application, this is allowed. So in this case, managed Word uh, on this device is able to accept that paste command, still maintaining that management, still, still in that management sandbox that's on this device that's being handled by these applications. Now if I try to save that document to personal storage, well again, my personal OneDrive uh, is not going to support company applications, but I have the ability to save it into my OneDrive for business. So perfectly okay, managed account, managed uh, information, company application, uh, giving me the ability to, again, keep that data always in a managed environment, always in a managed sandbox, and uh, the applications as well as the devices to support that. Now we do have steps to protect line of business applications as well, these applications that aren't necessarily built to that standard. Uh, so we actually have a wrapping tool, there's a, there's a wrapping tool that can be provi that is provided uh, to allow you to secure applications in that way, to make them uh, or designate them as a part of that, that secured sandbox of business applications. For building your own applications, uh, we recommend you look at the, the SDK for doing that, so you can actually have your applications natively play well with that and have them secured in that way and have them certified in that way so that when they are installed, uh, installed from, the Intune, from Intune and from the company portal onto that device, they are uh, a part of that managed set of applications on that user's device that can then uh, work in that way. So building the application, loading it into Intune, applying the mobile application management policies to that application, and then when that application is deployed, it's part of that secured set. Now, of course, part of that, uh, that cycle, that circle of life that we talked about with regard to mobile devices has to do with when that device is now being removed from that enrollment. And so you, as a user, go, may go into the company portal and say, yeah, I want to unenroll this device. I'm going to give it to re-gift it to my son, and uh, I don't want the company information on there. And so you simply go in there, you say, yes, remove this device from management, and that allows then the selective wipe to happen. So basically, <clears throat> command goes to the device, the device that supports it is able to then either, uh, either remove that, the applications and associated data, which is very important, um, from that device, or in the, in the you know, maybe more simple case, maybe there's a certificate involved in, in those applications and those applications now no longer work. They're still on the, on the disk, but they no longer work. Or perhaps the, uh, the data that was saved to the disk it was encrypted and now that certificate is gone, so they no longer have access to that, that data. But in the best case, applications that play well in this environment are going to be removing the data that they're responsible for and then removing themselves. But important point, the very bottom of the screen here, your personal data, your personal apps, all left intact if you simply remove that device from management and that selective wipe takes place. All right, we're right at the end here for time yeah. for some Q&A. We're actually a little bit over and we're doing pretty good, I think. We are. So there's a, there's a few little interesting questions that have been raised inside of the, um, the Q&A. Um, one of them is, can I have an MFA server on-premises rather than um, using Azure AD? Well, actually, yeah, you can. Um, we actually have a, um, a download for um, uh, Microsoft multi-factor authentication server. You can install that into an on-prem environment. You'll have to have things like the ability for it to dial out in order to be able to do its, um, its calls for um, making a phone call to be able to uh, authenticate your users. But yes, totally possible. And you could just use ADFS without using Azure Active Directory. It is just a lot easier to build and scale using Azure Active Directory. So it's kind of worth bearing both things in mind. Um, there is actually also, because we get a little bit of an extra kind of customization with the ability to do things on-prem with the multi-factor authentication server. You can make it do very much what you want to um, in an individual step-by-step um, -step basis. 
Uh, another one of the questions that, uh, that was asked a second ago was um, uh, what's actually, um, can you make it so that you can sign into apps on the iPad, um, like say for example uh, the Word app, without having to um, issue certificates to the end user? Just to set the context there, the Office apps on iPad at the moment don't understand um, multi-factor authentication, or in fact federated authentication. So as a result, um, when you try and sign into the applications, things get a little bit broken. What you have to do is actually issue a, um, an application password for that particular app. So if we go across into um, my demo environment for a second and go into Azure, uh, which appears to be giving me a spinning screen, that's always helpful, then let's have a quick look at where we can get those uh, passwords from. Wow, okay. We have a very, very spinning Azure screen there. This wasn't an intended demo, so uh, let's see if we can get back in there again. Manage dot uh, windows azure.com. Is it gonna let me in? Okay, that's not getting us there, but what it is possible to do is for every user who has their, uh, their details, their password hash stored inside of Azure AD, what we can actually do is generate a one-time password for each application that the user is going to use. And it's a, a long random 16 character password that the user can then use for say the, uh, an Outlook application or a, um, or a mail application that doesn't support using multi-factor or for in fact the Word, the Excel, the PowerPoint applications on iPad today. In fact, it can be used for any application that doesn't actually support the ability to do a, uh, an authentication using multi-factor um, or federated authentication. So it does provide you a lot of flexibility around that situation. Uh, just looking through um, a few other uh, changes, uh, Steve has asked, is there, a, is, have there been any changes around the way that uh, uh, Windows phones get uh, certificates for Intune? Actually, yeah, there has. Um, there's been a, a change with, um, a little change with uh, Windows Phone 8.1. We're on an iOS and Android jumpstart, so I'm not gonna go too far into it, but we now have the company portal application published directly to the Windows Phone store. And from there, you can go and download the application onto your device, and then you can use it to do enrollment. You can also use it to see any applications that have been published as deep links from uh, the Windows store on that device. The one thing you can't do is actually install a line of business application, do side loading on the device. And the reason for that is that the security mechanisms on Windows Phone actually require the um, application to be signed by um, a certificate for the, um, by a code signing certificate for your company. Well, let's just run this back. We need to have the ability to install that certificate on the device. And therefore, we have to have already signed the company portal application with that certificate. So, in order to make everything work for line of business apps, you have to um, download the store application, sign it yourself, upload it into Intune, and then you can install line of business apps. However, without that, you can do everything around deep linking and using the Windows Store uh, and using the company portal for enrollment, disenrollment, remote wipes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, just having a very quick look through the last few questions, and there's nothing that leaps out immediately. So we're running a little bit over. We're gonna take a break, let you guys grab a cup of coffee, and then when we come back, we're going to dive into looking at iOS management. We're going to actually break out a, uh, an Android, uh, a uh, iOS device, and we're going to start going through the process of what we can do with the particular iOS device. All right, Ben. See you soon.